What's not to love about a beeswax candle? That warm amber glow, the faint scent of honey and beeswax. It even improves the air quality in your house. In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can make a beeswax candle using materials that you will probably already even have in your house. I've been keeping bees for about 12 years and I've made many beeswax candles in that period of time. I also even made candles for an apiary I used to work for. So I'm gonna include lots of tips to help you avoid some of those common beginner mistakes. And then at the end, I'm gonna share with you some of the ways that I like to decorate my beeswax candles using beeswax fabric and twine and other layering techniques so that you can give these away as housewarming presents, holiday gifts, or even sell at the farmer's market. The first step is to get all the materials that you need out and ready. What you're gonna need is beeswax. And if your beeswax is a little bit dirty or even looks like this, then in the description of this video, I have links for how to render your wax. Uh, rendering is what we call cleaning our beeswax to turn it from honeycomb to clean solid chunks of wax like this. The second thing you're gonna need is coconut oil. Now this is optional, but it is common to put coconut oil in your beeswax candles so that your wax melts a little bit better. As you can see in this jar, there is a 16th to an eighth of an inch gap between where the wax ends and the wall of the jar is. And the reason for that is because when beeswax cools down, it shrinks. And so when you add coconut oil to this, you prevent having that gap between the beeswax and the wall of the container. If you're putting your candles, you're using a jar like this for your candles, and you have this mouth that is a little bit narrower than the rest of the jar, then you're actually not going to really notice this gap. But in something like this, you are going to notice this gap. And the ratio is 70% beeswax to 30% oil. So for example, for me, I am looking to do 24 ounces total of beeswax coconut oil for my candles. So 24 times 0.7 is 16.8, and that's how many ounces of beeswax I'm going to need. And 24 times 0.3 is 7.2, and that's how many ounces of coconut oil I'm going to need. If you are going to be using coconut oil, then I recommend also having a small kitchen scale so that you can weigh everything out. But if you're just using the beeswax, you can eyeball it and throw in wax and add a little bit more as needed. You're also going to need something to melt your beeswax in. This can be a crock pot, a slow cooker, or you can make a double boiler using pots and metal bowls you have at home. Uh, right here, I am using a crock pot. So I have this crock pot set to high and I just have to keep an eye on it because it will get really hot and you don't really want your beeswax getting much hotter than 2 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit or else your beeswax can start to burn. Uh, slow cooker is really the ideal way to melt your beeswax because it has a temperature dial. So you can put your beeswax in there, set the temperature to 200, and you can even go do other things and come back. And you don't have to worry about your beeswax um, burning, and it's just at that perfect temperature, it's not getting too hot. But you can also make a double boiler. So in order to make a double boiler, what you are going to want is one pot. What you want to do is put this over heat and fill it up with water. And then you want to either take another pot or a metal bowl and put it in here. You can also take one of those metal pitchers with the handle that you'll see on candle making supply sites. You can get one of these glass Pyrex measuring cups, the big ones, and you can put that inside your pot. You just don't want to put your beeswax directly into one pot and put it right onto heat on your stove or on a hot plate. You want it to be in something and you want the beeswax to be warmed up by the hot water in your pot, not by the heat down below. If you're gonna be adding a scent to your candles, then you're going to need that. And you're also going to want some small cup. This is, you know, just like a, measuring cup from that came with like my children's Tylenol. You need something to stir it with. This is a chopstick, scissors, a ruler, thermometer. This is an infrared heat thermometer, but you can also use a kitchen thermometer. 
and you are going to need the containers that you put your candles in. Now a few things when looking for containers to put your candles in. One, it has to be resistant to heat. You can put them in those little metal tins or you can put them in glass containers work really well. You just want the glass to be thick enough that it won't break when it is under high heat. I don't know about you, but I have definitely broken a few glass jars because I put hot tea in there and it just caused it to crack. And so that's what can happen when burning your candle if your the, the wall of your jar is too thin. So these work really well. Uh, two to three inches in diameter is the ideal width that you want your jar to be. What doesn't work well are things that are really tall and skinny because they're really hard to light. And you it's very common when you're pouring this and making your candle that you're going to get what they call a sinkhole, a hole at the top. You're also going to need a wick. And this is probably one of the few things you're actually going to have to purchase. The wick is that piece of string that's in the center of the candle that you light. And you are going to need the proper size for your jar. So what you wanna do is take the jar that you're gonna be putting your candle in and you wanna measure the diameter across the jar. Not just across the mouth of the jar, but the entire jar. And then you're gonna look at the chart I have here and figure out what size wick you're going to need. The one jar, since it's two and a half inches, is right on the cusp of needing a number five wick. So if you're gonna be selling these, the best thing to do is to make two candles, one with the number four wick, one with the number five wick, and then test them out and see which one burns better. In addition to your wick, you're going to need a way to get it to stand up in the wax. And you have two options. One option is to get one of these little metal clamps. Now, if you go to candle supply sites and Amazon, you're going to find that you can buy wicks pre-waxed in metal clamps. That is your option. That is a great option. It saves you an extra step. All you have to do then is glue it into your jar. Or what I do, because I really don't like to buy stuff if I don't absolutely have to, and I don't make a lot of uh, container candles anymore. I mostly uh, make my own molds and put my can candles in molds. So what I do is I just take my wick and I dip it in beeswax and hold it like this until it dries, so, which is, you know, maybe 20 seconds. And then the wick is stiff and I just hang it in the jar. If you are buying your wick like this and it's just a piece of string and it's not pre-waxed, you are also going to need clothespins or a stick or um, chopsticks to hold your wax and your wick at the top and place over the jar. And that is what you need to make candles. The next step is to measure out your beeswax and coconut oil if you're using it. And you wanna melt this to about 170 degrees. I'm gonna add the coconut oil later, but I can measure that out now while I'm waiting. So put my cup on the scale, hit tear to zero it out. And then I am looking for 7.2 ounces of coconut oil. I'm gonna hold on to this and let the beeswax melt for a little bit before I add the coconut oil in. And next we can get our jars ready. Now you see that I have a wooden board here on my kitchen counter and that's because I'm messy. I really cannot help it. I don't try to be messy. The harder I try to not make a mess, the more of a mess I make. And so usually I actually make candles outside on a folding table. Now to get our jars ready for the wick, I'm going to take my number four wick for this smaller jar and I'm just going to hold the wick down next to the jar and cut a piece that's just about an inch taller than the jar. Then what I'm going to do is show you the two ways that you can prepare your wick. For the bigger jar with the number five wick, what I'm going to do is take my wick and dip it into the beeswax that's melting. Not all the wax is melted, but enough is melted that I can coat my wick and just let it cool down for a few seconds. And once that drip at the bottom of the wick is hardening, then I take my finger and hold both ends of the wick so that the wick is straight. And I'm just gonna hold the wick straight for you know maybe 20 seconds or so until the wick hardens. And for the other wick, what we're going to do is take a metal tab. 
So I have my metal tab right here and there's a hole in it. One end has like a nipple that points up top and the other end just has a, is flat. So I'm going to hold the flat end towards me and take the wick and put it through the hole of this. There are different size tabs. So this one is borderline too small for a number four wick. You're going to need um, uh, the right size tab for the right size wick. So you want to feed it through until there's just a teeny little bit on the bottom. It looks like this. Then you're going to take your hot glue gun. You're going to put just a little bit of hot glue on the bottom of your tab. And you are going to put it into the bottom of the jar in the center. Or if you have glue dots, you can use a glue dot. The next step is to take your clothespin and hold your wick up straight. For this one, we're just going to suspend it in the jar. And what's best is that you leave about a quarter of an inch gap from the bottom of your wick and the bottom of the jar because you don't want the flame touching the bottom of your jar or else your jar is going to crack and you're going to have wax pouring out. Another thing to remember is that you want good ventilation when making these candles. Like I said, I like to do it outside. I do it in the carport or I do it in the garage or I just have a folding table outside. But if you do have bees on your property, Bees are really attracted to burning beeswax, uh, melted beeswax. And so you will have bees coming around <laughs> and they will dive into your wax. So having a container like this where the, um, there's a lid is really helpful. I've sold candles that had a dead bee in the bottom of it because they just dove right into it after, like right after I poured the candle. If it's cold outside though, you're going to want to do your candles inside. Even if you're not melting the candle outside, you want to bring it in to pour inside or else you're going to have issues with your candle hardening on the outside a little bit too fast compared to the inside and getting sinkholes and other problems. Where is my string safe? So now that most of the wax is melted, I added my coconut oil and we're going to leave this to finish melting. the lid, the whole handle fell off this. These things are great. I mean, I bought this for like $5 at a yard sale and I've been using it for like seven years now. Now we can get our scent ready while we're waiting for the wax to finish melting. I didn't used to add scents to my beeswax candles because I was a little bit of a purist and I liked the idea that beeswax, when it melts, they say it causes dust and allergens to fall to the ground and releases negative ions. It is the only wax that improves the air quality in your home. And I like that subtle scent of the beeswax and honey that they give off. But every single time I gave a candle to somebody, they would immediately smell it and be like, what does it smell like? And they'd be like, uh, it smells like wax. <laughs> so I just gave in and started adding scents to my candles. For me personally, I don't always add scents, but people love scents in their candles, especially if you're going to sell them. A really easy one is to go with lavender. It has calming properties. It's one of the more popular scents. So it's about one to two ounces per 24 ounces of candle beeswax coconut oil you're mounting. Once your max is, wax is fully melted and at least 169 degrees, take it off the heat. Turn your double boiler or whatever your heating device is off. You want to make sure that your wax is no higher than 170. It can be somewhere between 165 and 170 degrees Fahrenheit and that's when you can add your scent. You don't want to add it in too early or else it will dissipate. So my is about 168. Pour my scent in. If you add it, your scent and it's when it hits the wax, it causes some of the wax to harden. That's okay. Just stir it up and that wax will melt. Then what we're going to do is pour some of this wax into whatever container you're going to be using for pouring. 
this glass Pyrex jar works really well. You can get those pouring metal containers from candle supply sites. You can use a 32 ounce yogurt container. Just make sure your wax is no higher than 200 degrees Fahrenheit or it will cause that container to melt. I'm gonna put some wax into here so that it cools down a little bit faster because we want to pour at about 155 degrees Fahrenheit. What you want to look for is the wax starting to harden on the very top and making a little bit of a film. If you have a creme brulee torch, you can torch the top a little bit or you can pour it back into the original container where your wax is going to be a little bit hotter and stir it up to combine it. And then I'm going to pour it all into my pouring container. Usually I want to pour the biggest jars first. Slow and steady, but not too slow or else you'll have ridges on the side. And then center the wick. Once you're done pouring all your wax, you're going to leave it to cool down. You do not want to touch it or remove it while it's still liquid. You're going to see that it gets considerably lighter and that's when it's at the point that you can move it around. Once you can pick it up and it's room temperature and cool to touch, that's when you can take your clothespin off the top and trim your wick down. You want the wick to be, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch up above your wax. Now you have a nice little beeswax candle. Cleanup is a pain in the butt. So it's best to just have tools just for wax. You can put things into the freezer and that will harden it and make it really brittle so it snaps out. And then a lot of the wax just snaps right out. You can also take an old pot that you want to designate for candle making and take anything that's wax, um, that's glass or metal, fill up this pot with water, put it on a low heat, and then, you know, this is like an old jar that I had a candle in. I filled it up with water, put it in this pot full of water, and put it on low heat on your stove or on a hot plate. and let the wax melt and then you can uh, wash it with soapy water. Wax does still leave a film though. So anything you have melted wax on is probably not going to look like uh, brand new even after all of the cleaning and melting. So you made your candle and maybe it doesn't look totally perfect. Here are a few common problems and ways you can avoid them. In this candle, there's a tunnel. There's a lot of wax on the sides that wasn't melted and the wick caused a tunnel in the center. This is caused by having a wick that was too small. In this candle, you can see wax dripping down the sides. This was from pouring your candle, letting it harden, and then pouring more wax at the top after it hardened and some of it dripped down the sides. These lines in the side of the candle are caused by pouring too slowly or pouring where the outside temperature or the temperature of the jar was too cold and the wax hardened very fast while pouring. Here we have soot on the side of the candle and this is a common sign that your wick was too big or that the candle mouth is too narrow. This is a crack or what we might call a sinkhole and this is common in jars that are too narrow. Sometimes it's also caused by your wax being poured too hot. If you're going to be giving these candles away as presents or selling them, I recommend just getting a couple standard sizes and using them for your candles as opposed to going to thrift stores and gathering all the random jars that you have around your house. That way you can make a few candles uh, that is the size wick that is rec recommended according to the chart I showed you earlier in the video as well as trying one wick size smaller and one wick size larger. I did a sample in this jar and I did a number four, number five, and number six wick. So you'll see in the number four wick, it burned just fine, but there was a lot of wax wasted on the side that never melted. 
and it did cause a tunnel down in the center. The number five size wick melted really well. You can see it melted all of the wax along the side here, and there is no tunnel in the center. So this is the size wick that I want to use when working with these can candle jars. The number six wick did also melt the wax on the side, but the flame kept going out after it reached about a half an inch down into burning. You also see that when I was burning it, the wick was really tall and skinny and kept flickering. One way that I really like to decorate my candles is by using a combination of burlap and then wax dipped fabric. So I just got a roll of burlap and then I trim off this edge that has the wire in it to make it a little bit shorter because otherwise it takes up a little bit too much of the candle. So I like to shorten it up a little bit. And then I take some fabric that has a little bit more of a design on it. This one has butterflies and dragonflies. And I cut a strip and then I put it and dip it into beeswax. You wanna leave it about an eight, half an inch extra watt length so that you're going to take your beeswax before you pour it into the jars and you're going to dip your fabric in the beeswax just like you did with your wicks. You just want to make sure that the entire fabric is in the wax and then you're going to pull it out and hold it while the wax drips off. Once it stops dripping and it is hardened and cooled to the point that you can touch it, you're going to take the bottom and hold it so that it's straight. And then you're just going to lay it down and let it totally cool down and dry. So then what I do is I take the burlap that I cut and I first put that around the jar and then I take my waxed fabric and I layer that on top of the burlap. Now the waxed fabric sticks to itself pretty well and really stays in place but I like to just put a layer of glue, hot glue anyway. Another way I like to decorate my candles and my soaps is to use a beeswax stamp. This one says Aloha. I've seen a lot that have a honeybee or a flower on Amazon. I have it in my affiliate page. You can get one made with your name or logo if you want to, and you have to buy a specific kind of wax for the stamping, but then you can just take like a nice ribbon. I'm using this plain gold ribbon. Wrap it around. Put a little bit of glue on top. And then put your beeswax stamp over it. For this one, I just took some raffia. I like the texture of it, and it comes in a bag like this. I'll just pull some out. Took one of the jars and wrapped it around the jar a few times. Tied a knot, and then just hot glued some pieces to the artificial Christmas tree we have that fell off when we were taking it out of the box. And then we also have a Brazilian pepper tree here. It produces these pinkish red peppercorns. So I uh, glued them onto this one. You can add a lot of the stores, Target, Walmart, craft stores, they sell the pieces to add to garland. That works as well. Or pine cones that you find and holly that you find around. And this one is the raffia and then I just pick some flowers out of the garden. I didn't press them, I just let them sit on my desk to dry out and then I hot glued them. When you're decorating your jars, what I think looks best is when you have some layering, a little bit of texture and something that is bold as well as something that is not so bold. Thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel. 
If you have any extra tips that you want to add or great websites, resources for candle making, please include them in the comments below. I would love to hear how your candle making process has gone and what you've made with them. See you in the next video.